Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. It is 8.5 million acres of nearly pristine Arctic habitat. It's remote and encompasses the majority of the Brooks Range in northern Alaska. The peaks here can rise to a little over 7,000 feet in elevation, and almost all the park's territory is mountainous. Most of the 10 inches of precipitation that falls here yearly is bound in snow, which melts each spring. This flood of water signals the salmon to migrate upstream to spawn their next generation. Brown bears are then drawn to the willow and alder bushes that grow alongside the waterways to fish for those salmon. Animals you might see include black bears, musk oxen, moose, doll sheep, wolves, wolverines, coyotes, and lynxes. River otters and beavers swim the creeks and eagles, hawks, and owls patrol the tundra for pikas, ground squirrels, and lemmings. In the Brooks Range Valley, over a half a million caribou migrate in pursuit of the most nutritious grazing grounds. Reportedly, only 132 brown bears call the park home, which is a density of one bear for every 100 square miles. That means your odds are not great to see one, but in the event you do, the disposition of the bear may be your greatest concern. Robert Bell was born in Ithaca, New York, and received his law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He was part of a team of lawyers at K. Scholar, Fearman, Hayes, and Handler that had recently won the largest award granted by a federal jury to that point of $100 million. He was a brilliant man, but was known for being a caring and genuine person and described as not your typical lawyer type of person. In the months leading up to August 1996, 42-year-old Bell had been planning a backcountry boating and hiking trip with two of his friends in the gates of the Arctic National Park. They chartered their route to travel the river system that followed the Noatak River, which flows north and west into the Chukchi Sea. Bell and his friends would float for part of the day, then beach their boat at planned waypoints. This pause in their float would allow them to hike up trails and take in scenery that most people will never get to set their eyes on. They were aiming to start their big adventure on August 19, 1996. Bell's group had brought backpacks and the typical camping gear to prepare food and set up tents, as most people would do. They would even had the forethought to attach bear bells to their backpacks to let the bears know they were around. Additionally, they planned to talk and make noise as they hiked, just to make sure the bears got the message. They didn't take any firearms, though. Whether it was a matter of the added weight they would have to carry, or simply the lack of expectation of needing one, either way, they chose not to bring them along. The adventure began with energy and excitement, and by Tuesday, August 26th, they had arrived near the confluence of the Noatak and Kugrak rivers. The location was on their waypoints list, so they beached their boat and gathered their hiking gear to do some exploration. One of the hikers, whom we'll call Sam, decided to stay with the boat and let Bell and their other companion, whom we'll call Mike, go on the hike without him. Bell and Mike spent the better part of the day hiking up the Kugrak River, and after turning around, were on their way back toward their boat. While passing through a patch of seven-foot-tall willows, the men caught sight of a brown bear sow with her cub. They had seen her while still a few hundred yards from her, and had time to discuss navigating around the bears at a safe distance. They planned to make noise as they circled her so that she would not be alarmed by their presence and either run away or allow them to pass her. Now to understand how the men's sense would travel in this environment, we must first discuss the weather. That day there were strong gusts of wind blowing consistently from the north to the south most of the afternoon. Temperatures hovered at just above 40 degrees for the same time frame. There was no precipitation reported in the area, which means that scents would be carried further and in higher concentrations on the breeze. Given the mountainous terrain, scents tend to travel in the same direction as the wind and follow contours like the airflow. If the overall flow of air is along a river drainage, then the scent of the men would tend to travel that same route. A consistent breeze may carry a human scent right past a bear's nose, but even a slight shift could bring the scent directly to the bear. The consistent wind created a noisy rustle that would keep any sound the men could generate from reaching the bear's sense of hearing. 
Mike decided he would go first, and slowly proceeded around the sow and her cub, while talking and making noise. It was tense going, and Bell watched from an elevated point to see how the sow reacted as Mike passed by. As Bell watched, he could see the sow lifting her head and sampling the air, but she didn't have an alarmed or aggressive reaction to Mike's presence. This emboldened Bell that his hike around her would go as well as Mike's did. Once he saw Mike wave at him from the far side of the bears, Bell planned to travel the same route and do the same things that Mike did. If it worked for him, it should work fine for Bell too. The only problem with that kind of thinking is that it relies on the predictability of bears. Mike looked on as Bell initiated his turn to pass the bears. He was about halfway through the route and making noise when Mike saw the sow's head lift. She suddenly became very focused on the spot where Bell was making noise. In a split second, the sow became a brown streak that was headed straight for his friend. Mike could hear the willows popping and tossing as the bear blew through them. He next heard Bell yell for help, followed by grunts and growls from the sow. In a matter of seconds, Mike could hear nothing from Bell's location. Not a moan or a shout. Nothing. Mike had no doubts about what had happened to his friend. After his shouts went unanswered, he quickly made his way back to the boat and informed Sam about Bell's fate. The two friends decided to return to the attack site and see if they could recover Bell's body. Once they located his corpse, they knew his death was quick. He didn't struggle very long with the wounds he suffered. They carried Bell's corpse back to the location of their boat to ensure it wasn't consumed by the bears. Now in one of the most remote areas in the world, without a means to reach anyone, the men decided to do the only thing they could do. They worked out a plan to try to signal passing aircraft to summon help. By Saturday, August 31st, the men were flown out alongside Bell's body. Upon examination, Bell was noted to have died instantly from the damage the sow had done to his body. This means that most likely he'd died from a strike or bite to his head or neck, or instantaneous death would not have been likely. Bell's wife, Jody, also an attorney, flew up to Alaska to bring his body home for burial. Following the attack, officials closed off the area to aid in their investigation. They wanted to take a good look at the bear population before allowing people back in the area. After reviewing the circumstances of Bell's fatal bear attack, they decided to take no action against the bear. They deemed the sow's behavior normal for a brown bear protecting her young. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. What triggered the sow to attack Bell, but not Mike? Do you think the noise the men made aggravated the sow? Why on earth didn't these guys pack firearms? Would you have tried to sneak around a sow brown bear and her cub? I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.